In this episode of Another Zelda Podcast, David and Kate get together to talk about the making of Link's Awakening. Hello and welcome to Another Zelda Podcast. I am David Geisler, your co-host tonight, and my uh, regular co-host Kate May is here with me as well. Kate, how are you? Hello! I'm good. How are you? I'm well. It's always a pleasure when we get to do, this is almost like a classic episode, one of these little behind the scene episodes. Mm-hmm. We're talking about the making of Link's Awakening today. Yes, we are. And um, we're recording in the middle of a, what is it, Saturday today? Yes, it is. Even that's kind of like old times, actually. I know. It's wow. like like the olden days, and I'm happy to be back, or rather, you're back here. I'm, ba- well, I'm back. Well, that was the whole thing. <laughs> you, you, you and your husband, were you were going to come to Chicago and hang out with us, and then things didn't quite work out. So, yes. so Gingsy and I said, well, we've got the weekend off. We're coming to you. <laughs> yeah. We couldn't find a puppy sitter, so she's in the background. So if you hear uh, barking or jingling, that's that's why. Well, it's still fun for, to have the four of us hang out this yeah. weekend, and um, I know, uh, you know recording these episodes would be great, too. Yes. Uh, so... Let's do some listener feedback. I don't have a lot for this episode. I only have like three. Okay. But I think we also have a pretty cool story. So I'm excited also about this Link's Awakening episode because Mm -hmm. um, it the when I did Zelda 64 and when we did um, what was the other one? Oh, the Hyrule Fantasy. Mm -hmm. I had some notes, but I don't know if you had as many. And I see many notes here. Yeah, I was able to do some fun little conversation. Do some research for this one. Oh, I love it. Okay, let's do listener feedback. all right, here we go. This is a review over on iTunes by Rich as Rubies. Rupees. Rich as Rupees. Oh. I love it when the, the screen names also Zelda have a Zelda related. reference. You're like, <laughs> wow, you, the, the commitment there. Even, they even get they, it. Yeah, they, right, exactly. Even if the screen name had already been picked, it's like, well, you found the right place. You, mm-hmm. found, you mm-hmm. found home. Um, uh, Rich as Rupees here says, love this podcast. Over the course of the last month and a half, I've listened to every episode and I have no complaints. Good. You <laughs> shouldn't. Nice. If you do, don't tell us. Just kidding. <laughs> Unfortunately, none of my friends are into Zelda like I am, but listening to this podcast has made me feel like I have a new group of friends that love The Legend of Zelda. Aww. David, Kate, and the rest of the crew are awesome. I'm so glad Kate is back for season four. Aww. Nothing but the best wishes for her and her family. Also, major props to David for keeping the show running amongst COVID. Indeed. Wish you guys the best moving forward and... But there's not a more link. So, well, oh, maybe maybe uh, ran out of space. Rich's rubies <laughs> and pushed the enter button a little too early. Maybe it was that. Yeah. You know how you sometimes accidentally hit enter, like when you're trying to do a text message on mm-hmm. iMessage or something like that. Rich's rubies. That's all we got because there isn't. There is not even the view more link here on, oh. on iTunes. So I think that's it. Well, what was said was very very nice, and I agree. Super cool. It was it was impressive that you have been keeping this going. Oh my goodness! Throughout all the <laughs> that was a heck of a that was a heck of a year and a heck of a season, and it certainly wasn't just because of me. It was really you know it was all those blog writers kind of really came in and, and kind of like helped yes. help save the day there too in a lot Absolutely. of ways. Absolutely. And now we have a whole new family. Yeah. Now we got a Zelda family or I an AZP know. family, including our listeners. There will be a day. There will be a day, some way, somehow, in the next couple of years, where we're going to somehow fi- I'm going to figure out for a, a way for us <laughs> to do like some roundtable episodes where yeah. we can get some of those blog writers into the Midwest or something. For sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, wouldn't that be fun? Totally. All right. All right. So, whoa. Okay. This one, literally the title is, hi, Kate. <laughs> oh, hi. <laughs> and this is just, this is just from a few days ago. Oh, hi. <laughs> oh, hey. Hi. Um, this is two, this is from Two Critical Two. And, oh, this is really sweet, Kate. Um, maybe this must, I don't know. It's just a review on iTunes. So okay. I don't, it's not about a specific episode, but it just says, so good to see you. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of O's and a lot of U's in that. Uh, the flow of time is always cruel. It's speed. It's speed seems different for each person. Oh, this is a chic quote, mm-hmm. but no one can change it. A thing that doesn't change with time is a memory of younger days. Fair enough. Too critical too. a nice little note. And, Aww. uh, it is so good to see <laughs> you, Kate. It's so good to be here. <laughs> <gasps> oh my! Okay, we'll do one more, and then we're gonna jump into our. This is a this is a comment over on YouTube. Cool. Um, this is a reply to an episode that um, Dan McCoy and I did a while back. Cool. Actually, I think as as of this recording, I think it just came out 
recently, an episode or two ago. You, you maybe even have not even had a chance to listen to it yet, Kate, mm-hmm. but it is the Zelda Media wish list. Mm. So Dan and I did an episode where we posited if there was a way to have um, Zelda exist in other mediums, what would we most enjoy seeing them as? Cool. Um, my third submission was a Zelda water park. So that. <laughs> I want a Zelda water park. And I think there's something in here about that. That's why I wanted to mention that. Oh, that's cool. Dan, one of Dan's highlights for me that made me literally laugh organically and out loud was he wanted a, um, a Richard Attenborough style wildlife documentary series oh of Breath of the Wild. That's so awesome. And then we actually had a listener. I don't have this in my notes right now, but we had a listener send us. It might have been Beth, uh, who's who's um, just starting up her own show. Mm-hmm. Um I don't even know her. I can't remember her last name right now, but it's a listener and, and she started up her own podcast called Gir- Girl Gaming Podcast or something like that. I'm okay. sorry that I don't have it up in front of me, but she sent me a link and someone out there made a, like a, a David Attenborough. Did I say Richard Attenborough earlier? A David Attenborough. <laughs> um, it's just because I love Jurassic Park so much. Oh. <laughs> um, a David Attenborough style documentary. And then uh, Dan was also saying that he'd love to see like a um, a history, a Hyrule Historia narrated by Morgan Freeman. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I, was, I was in on that idea. He did a little, he quickly was like, he said, David, just imagine. Imagine just having it come up and hearing like, and then the do- the Deku tree. Did, you know, I, I like, <laughs> oh, he did it so much better than I. I don't have a good Morgan Freeman uh, impression. I was like, Dan, I'm in. I'm That's in. awesome. So it was a great episode. Okay, so anyway, a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a weird one. It's a little, it was a little off our normal style. We just kind of did some wish lists. I thinking. Like it. It was I fun. Like it. Uh, so Andrea... Refohos, I believe, over here on YouTube, said, great ideas. Now you have me wishing things I never thought I would want. Thanks. In addition to water rides and roller coasters, I think the technology of the more recent immersive simulators is my choice when it comes to Legend of Zelda, Mm. like the simulators in Animal Kingdom's Avatar and Universal's Harry Potter. Just imagine having the point of view of Navi as you watch Link go through epic battles and a hard-fought journey. I think that would be incredibly cool. I yeah. think that would be cool. I did not read all of this this full comment. Yeah. Have you, I think you've maybe been to like Harry Potter land and stuff yes. like that, right? <laughs> yeah, so the, we did the, ride one of those. The right? Wizarding Worlds. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, any thoughts on this? Yeah, no, that would be amazing. And I mean, hello, now there is a Nintendo, you know, theme park. So yes. easily could throw that in there. Um, I mean, I'm sure there will be something in the future there is this is a little timely i usually like to keep these episodes pretty evergreen but but um it hit the news a few months ago that um the lost continent area in universal studios Mm -hmm. islands of adventure Mm -hmm. i think it's even next door to the the hogsmeade area for harry potter on the map i've never been there but i just i think it is Mm -hmm. there there's talk about it being reskinned there's been some patents filed and some some things and there's it's out there in the world and I don't have the sources with me right now that um, there's some pretty hard evidence that that's going to be reskinned as a Zelda um, experience. There's patents for like moving chairs that go in and out with a Triforce in the middle and all this kind of stuff. And we'll see. I think that's pretty interesting because you're absolutely right. There is the Super Nintendo Land at Universal Studios in Japan right now. Mm -hmm. We all know that Super Nintendo Land is absolutely planned and coming to and already starting to be built Mm -hmm. in California and Florida. In Florida, it's going to be part of the Epic Universe. And in California, I don't know. Probably just going to wedge it into Universal Studios somewhere. (laughs) Sure. Um, But there is the second tier of Super Nintendo Land. Mm-hmm. is the Donkey Kong Country area. Maybe you kind of know some about this. You're nodding as if you kind of know what I'm talking about. No. no? Okay. I, I don't. I haven't. Oh, really? I mean, I've heard. I was like looking at it when it was first, you know, getting introduced. And I watched this little video about it where they were like showing you what it looks like. Um, but no, I haven't heard of anything like recent. Like the video where Miyamoto's like walking around yeah. showing like, look at this cool that. thing. I yeah. watched it too. I was yeah. like, oh my God, that place looks amazing. Like I showed it to Bill and I was like, look at that turtle spinning and the coins and the blood. We have a couple of um, listeners or uh, uh, followers on our Instagram that uh, of AZP that often go to the Japanese um, cool. Super Nintendo world. And I, I find, I see a lot of cool pictures of that. Very cool. But anyway, um, the third, the second tier is supposed to be Donkey Kong Country, but there were okay. there were some descriptions of like a third tier being a Zelda thing and stuff like that. Nice. Th- what I'm trying to say is it's conceivable that Universal Studios has a good relationship with Nintendo right now, also with Imagination doing or Illumination doing the Mario movie. Mm-hmm. 
Um, this is all very timely, so I got to get off this. <laughs> but um, I, it's conceivable that if Lost Continent needs a reskin and a new ride, maybe it ends up being Legend of Zelda themed. That's conceivable. <laughs> I think they should do it. I think that I think it'd be like easy quote unquote to do i mean that's just like there's so much material available and so much that would translate to a ride different kinds of rides many different kinds of rides like you said i think a water park is totally reasonable too considering oh, yeah. so much of these games is is water centric i mean i basically was taking zelda conventions and just theming them on pre-existing water ride experiences hey and and actually the wave pool was not lake hilia it was obviously the Great Bay because mm. Lake Hillia very is, isn't wavy at all. And right. Think about all the Lake Hillias. They're always at either half drained or like yeah. very, <laughs> very. <laughs> um, lake is depressing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Lake Hillias, I guess in Ocarina, that comes back around and it's really nice with that little island in the middle. But yeah. anyways, we or maybe there's a Link's Awakening opportunity there with um, mm. with the water. Yeah. So. Segway, unless there's another one. No, that's it. Okay, yeah, Segway. It was, it was a clunky segue, but it worked. I think I it got like us it. there. I like it. We today are going to be talking about the making of Dreaming Island. <laughs> Not the best initial name, <laughs> I don't think. So we Not as poetic. I um I, I I know when it was called this, and I'll speak to that when I get to my notes. I put my notes together in kind of like in timeline order here. Sure. Um but I learned, I, I really get a kick out of naming these episodes that we do that are kind of making of episodes. I, I really enjoy naming the episodes what what is perceived to be like the working title mm-hmm. of the game. Yeah. Zelda 64, Hyrule Fantasy. The, I found a couple sources that said that the working, because Dreaming Island allegedly was never really filed. It wasn't like they put a trademark out for it. Mm. It was just what it was referred to as by the developers when they were building this game. Gotcha. So some reports say Dream Island, which I think might just be translated to like English a little bit, Mm -hmm. you know. But if you think about Dreaming Island, I actually think that is, even in English, more appropriate. It's not an island of dreams. It's an island... That is dream- dreaming like, <laughs> in a sense, and that right. if it's the windfish, you know what I mean? Yeah. No, oh, I agree totally. So apparently it was the Legend of Zelda Dreaming Island. I like Dreaming Island, so I'm going to stick with that. I found okay. more sources that said that than Dream Island. And uh, we're going to talk about it. Let's do it. So you've you 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 played Link's Awakening way back in season one on the Game Boy. Yes. And I know that you've poked around a little bit on the Switch version. Yes, I played the Switch version. Played it? Yep. Yeah. Great, mm-hmm. cool. Awesome. Yeah. Ooh, great. Um, so I my notes start. So this will be kind of new because we'll be going back and forth a little bit. Yep. But my notes start in 1984. Oh, my gosh. Should I start there? Yeah. Oh, my name <laughs> go back that far. Wow. I'm here in like 1990, like two. <laughs> well, it's a bit of a cheat. It's a bit of a cheat. My timeline starts with 1984. The Legend of Zelda is being created for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Okay. All right. So that's kind of where we, we're at. Going way, way back. Yes. But the, what's really interesting about the... Uh, Link's Awakening's inception is that there were three or four threads that kind of came together before the game even really started to be, to come to fruition, I guess. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of tracked these threads backwards a little bit and, and decided to kind of present them this way. Okay. So, of course, The Legend of Zelda uh, is being created for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1984. And at the time, while we've talked about this in the past, while Super Mario Brothers was being made and The Legend of Zelda was being made, mm-hmm. um, a young art school student who had recently graduated, his name was Takashi Tezuka. I'm sure you're familiar with that name based mm-hmm. on your notes. Mm-hmm. Um, he joined Nintendo. He was a recent graduate. And um, some of his first projects, he got put like on a team that was working on because we both know that Super Mario Brothers and Legend of Zelda was kind of it was two teams, but they were kind of being co-made. Yep. That's to how video games worked. Video games were so small back then, and and the world certainly Nintendo was learning how to even like what these games would be mm-hmm. beyond something like an Atari game. You know, when you actually have some graphics and stuff like that. Okay, anyway, um, and so uh, Takashi Tezuka starts uh, work. He so he has roots with the Legend of Zelda. Mm-hmm. He's on the team. Mm-hmm. Then we can fast forward to 1989, about five years later, Mm -hmm. and that's the year the Game Boy was released. Ah. And um, if you have any interjections here, if I'm moving too fast, you let me know at any time. You Um, go. You go, boy. So the Game Game Boy is very successful in the beginning, largely because of Tetris and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But apparently, internally, um, the – so, you know, know, I just realized something. I don't even have notes on this, but I think it was the R&D1 team – that maybe made the Game Boy and did a lot of the development. Mm-hmm. And I'll remind you that there's in, in, in Nintendo history, 
There are many development teams, but the two most famous development teams are EAD and R&D1. EAD, I actually have it in my notes later on in my notes. Uh, EAD stands for Entertainment Analysis and Development. Mm -hmm. And R&D1 stands for Research and Development. And, I, and it, in fact, it was called R&D until there was also an R&D2 and an R&D3, which I learned about later. And as a quick side note, I learned that R&D2, they, the, they were the tier of programmers that basically would work on like Game Boy ports, if a Nintendo game was getting ported to the Game Boy. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. R&D1 would kind of come up with crazy <laughs> ideas. R&D1 famously, th that team uh, famously did like all the Wario games. Oh, nice. So they were, that was the team where, so EAD a lot of, it's, EAD is kind of like, they're not the jocks at Nintendo, <laughs> but they're kind of like, the, they're the trumpets in the band, right? Okay. They're the ones okay. that are like, okay, we know what we're doing. We're making the hits. We're making good games. Let's keep on going. Mm -hmm. um, then R&D1, and these, this is broad strokes here, but R&D1 was the group uh, that would kind of like, it was well research and development. Let's experiment. Let's make some weird stuff. Let's see where it goes. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes R&D games would be kind of brought over to EAD, and sometimes people would move back and forth from these two development teams. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... I, th I think, I don't have notes on this, but I think R&D 1 was the team that was responsible for like the Game Boy games and maybe even the creation of the Game Boy. Okay. So it was there. It was around. It was a success. Mm -hmm. But the EAD team, they were less focused on it because they were <laughs> really busy making Nintendo games and eventually Super Nintendo games. Mm -hmm. So now we can, that, this allows us to fast forward uh, about a year later to 1990. And... Um, um, 1990 in my notes here is when the development for a link to the past begins mm -hmm. for the super Nintendo. Yes. And I actually learned that there was a Miyamoto was involved with Zelda two, the adventure of link or mm -hmm. the adventures of link. I always forget if it's plural or not, but there was actually a different director for that one. I don't have that in my notes, but mm -hmm. I remember reading about it. And I know we both know from the Zelda 64 episode that Miyamoto has kind of gone down in history. He's openly talked about how he was actually pretty um, inspired by the fighting mechanics that happened in Zelda 2. Remember the, the shield and the sword and there's ducking and weaving. And yeah. he brought a lot of that into Ocarina of Time. Mm -hmm. We talked about that a few seasons ago. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, even be, nevertheless, Zelda 2 was so different that when the Super Nintendo came around, Miyamoto was very passionate about trying to essentially reinterpret the original Legend of Zelda for Super Nintendo. They mm -hmm. wanted He wanted to return to the roots, even though it was only the third game, <laughs> um, and really see if he could do the things he always wanted to do for the Legend of Zelda, but do it on a Super Nintendo. Mm -hmm. Bigger, better, more, basically. Right. You know? So that brings us to um, the Super Nintendo. So, so Miyamoto was very emotionally adamant, apparently, to kind of try to stay as true as possible to the original Legend of Zelda in A Link to the Past. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think that's evident by the fact that you actually can't hold a lot of items. Really, that's just why. You know, if you think about it, B is your sword and you have to pause. You pick one item mm -hmm. and that maps to B and there it is. Mm -hmm. Is that how it works in The Legend of Zelda too? I think? I haven't you have A and one. B up there. And you pick your items and it just maps to B. Okay. You, your sword is always in your hand for A. I don't know how you remember these things. <laughs> oh, weirdly, that's the stuff I remember. A lot of times I forget characters' names and stuff. And I'm like, the guy in the shed. <laughs> but the mapping of the buttons on the controllers was very interesting. That you remember. Well, there. that's that's hopefully why we're a good team here, Kate. So <laughs> I feel like I might be closing in to where some of your notes are. So, yeah, yeah. So what I have next here is um, Tezuka, Takashi Tezuka, who is mm -hmm. our main character in this story. Yes. Um, Tezuka was eventually, not initially, but eventually brought on to A Link to the Past. Mm -hmm. And so much so that as A Link to the Past was in development, they assigned him to be the director. Mm -hmm. And Tezuka was inspi also inspired by Zelda 2, you could say. And he, re I think I'm, I'm um, projecting this or I am assuming this. I'm not sure. You know, there is not, there is not an interview where... to. Tezuka has said what I'm about to say, mm -hmm. but it feels like there. I'll say that it feels like the radical changes that happened from Zelda one to Zelda two. I'll just say, um, inspired Tezuka to even think about extra things that you could do for a Zelda game. Sure. And so he came into a link to the past as the director and kind of wanted to do a lot of new stuff. Yes. And Miyamoto uh, apparently did show some restraint and wanted to kind of keep things keep things down. So um, let's see here. Yeah, Tezuka he, wanted to kind of, he was thinking out of the box, that's for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. Over the years, Tezuka had time to think about these things. Um, some of the stuff that he wanted to do was he wanted the characters to be a little sillier in A Link to the Past, goofier, mm -hmm. you know, crazy stories and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. 
And, um, and famously, you probably did a little bit of reading about the crazy, the bomb, the item combo stuff. It's okay if you didn't. I don't, I didn't catch that part. No. Yeah, no problem. No problem at all. So one of the things that he brought to the team for a link to the past, he said, well, what if link could combine items? That would be really cool. Yeah. Uh, hence combine a bomb and an arrow, yeah. create a bomb arrow. Yeah. The thing is the way that they had the button mapping on the super Nintendo, you might, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. B was the sword and Y was the item. X was map and A was like runners. Oh, A was just generally pick up and interact, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Maybe they could have considered remapping the buttons, but with the current way they were mapped, it would have meant that the sword would have to be unequipped. If you can't do that. Right. Well, to me, Miyamoto said, no way, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> he did not say that. He called him Jose for sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. And Tezuka said, I, I, I beg your pardon. That is, I'm not Jose. <laughs> um, but no, Miyamoto was really adamant about having Link have the sword all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I think it's interesting. And I can see why Miyamoto might have gone that direction creatively. Um, it was, the sword was really, really important in the first game. In fact, it was kind of, it's kind of ironic that Miyamoto was also the guy in the first game that said, take Link's sword away in the beginning. <laughs> Remember that story from uh -huh, the Zelda fantasy uh -huh. or the Hyrule fantasy? Um, but really, it, Miyamoto didn't say take the sword away. Miyamoto said, if we take the sword away, we will teach the character how important the sword is. Right. And so he wanted to keep the sword. So that was all. This stuff was kind of put to the wayside during A Link to the Past. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add in this area? I mean... I don't know where you're kind of pulling in. If you're yeah, 92, know. are you more Link's Awakening? Uh, uh, yeah, so I do know that, you know, something that Tezuka wanted to put into A Link to the Past was the world ending when a massive egg on top of a mountain broke. Really? That was originally meant for Link to the Past. Yeah. I have that in my notes. Yeah. And how that came to be. And you might be right. Yeah. It lines up with my notes. Uh, it's it's inferred, I guess. Yep. So that I'm was fine. that was initially meant for that game, but obviously then, and we can talk more about this, you yeah. know, kind of morphed into the side after hours project that Link's Awakening became. Indeed. Well, there was actually, I'm going to jump forward in my notes for a second. Yeah. Um, there was a programmer named, um, I think it's Kanuke Tanabe. I know Tanabe is how you pronounce this gentleman's last name. Mm -hmm. Tanuke Kanabe, Tanabe. And I guess... You know, I've read that that he had this kind of passionate idea for the the egg thing, but I'm sure that he and Kazumi are chatting and talking. And I've read that this uh, Kanabi gentleman had the idea of the world ending egg for a long time, mm. but he was never able to implement it. So I'm sure those conversations came up, you know, yeah, into yeah. the past. Yeah, I whenever I was doing when I was reading um, about Link's Awakening and the making of it, those two names were together a lot. So, for example, in yeah. the encyclopedia that we both have, the Zelda encyclopedia, they're both brought up at the same time in terms of um, Tanabe was thinking about. Oh, yeah, it does say the giant egg as well for them. But and then also being in a dream that may be yours or maybe someone else's. Yeah. There's this whole dream thing. So obviously that didn't quite fit for Link to the Past. And that's why they put these into. You know, it's funny. A Link to the Past kind of plays it straight. I mean, there is the whole dark world where Link turns into a bunny, which I thought was a dramatic left turn. Yeah, for Zelda game. <laughs> for sure. But for the most part, that game does play it pretty, pretty by the book, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Interesting. Except for the bunny. Yeah. Except for that bunny. Um, uh, so what happens is, as, as you and I, I think both know, but hopefully what we can tell our listeners is that during A Link to the Past, um, a gentleman named, and I have his name here and I, uh, tried to, tried to bold it and I'm having a hard time finding it in my notes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm upset with you. Oh, oh, here it is. Kazuki, uh, Murata. Marita? <laughs> Kazuki Marita. Okay. Marita. We apologize in advance uh, and afterwards for all the pronunciations of all of these names. Well, Kazuki Marita was <laughs> a, he was a coder and, and they were, you know, I understand that he was working on a link to the past with, with Kazumi. Mm -hmm. And apparently, you know, it, after hours, even during a link to the past, um, Maruta was, was goofing around with this thing called the Game Boy mm -hmm. and the dev kit. There was kind of one sitting around the office, so to speak, because usually that stuff gets handed out pretty officially. Mm -hmm. One sitting around the office, and he was just goofing around trying to learn how this, because there was like a curiosity with the e e and EAD team. Mm -hmm. They weren't working on Game Boy games at the time. Um, many of them had no experience with it, but this this gentleman was was curious. And of course, the story goes that Kazumi found um, Morita 
poking around one night, you could say, mm-hmm. and got excited and said, oh, what's, you know, what's that? And they start looking at the code and looking at the dev kit and just kind of learning what it what is what the Game Boy is all about. Yeah. But then after a little while, very shortly, uh, Kazuki re- realized that Mar- Maruda was Marita was trying to build something like a Zelda game, mm-hmm. you know, on the Game Boy. Yep. And uh, Kazumi or Tezuka got very, very excited about this. Yes. So you maybe can pick up from here. I'm sensing from the tone in your voice. Yeah. So I've got I plenty mean, of notes, but let's do it. From what I saw, yeah, they were basically trying to port a Legend of Zelda game to the Game Boy. And I think originally they were trying to port Link to the Past to the Game Boy. Oh, I have some details about that. Yeah. Oh, okay. sure. Do well, it. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. They, well, we, you know what it was is they were, there was a, the way I have read it from, from a couple different sources is that they were trying that they were like trying to basically like a Zelda style game. So a, a look, you know, top down, maybe a character that kind of looked like Link, something like that. They were just poking around with it. Mm-hmm. And then they started to realize that, you know, there was this, this kind of everyone, every report I've read is like the after school club, basically yes. these different E and EAD uh, programmers started getting more and more curious about this Game Boy dev kit. Mm -hmm. And as a game started to kind of develop out of that, everyone started hanging out and working after hours. So Mm -hmm. they would do all their EAD super cool games during the day. (laughs) And then uh, in the evenings, they would stay late and work on like a passion project. Yep. And I don't even think that it was like super serious. Like you said, they were just kind of goofing off. and They're just goofing off. But this is where Tezuka, Tezuke? Tezuka. Tezuka, um... He is recognizing kind of what's what's coming to be. Mm-hmm. And he obviously has a couple extra ideas that weren't expressed in A Link to the Past. So A Link to the Past comes out. It's a great big success. Fine. Um, Tezuka eventually, I, I guess after a couple months or whatever, eventually goes to the higher ups, the execs, and says, oh, and by the way, there was absolutely no talk about a Zelda game on Game Boy while they were doing this. This mm-hmm. was like a secret project. Secret in that they just they were just goofing around. Right. Making as many fun and cool things as they could. And it, it also gave Tezuka uh, an opportunity to try things like a bomb arrow and stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. having Link not necessarily hold the sword. So apparently he brings a, a I'll call it a duct taped piece of code together to a meeting <laughs> and kind of pitches the idea of a Zelda game mm-hmm. on the Game Boy to the execs. Mm-hmm. And the way I understand it is that they were basically like, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> The Game Boy wasn't, it was so weird because every, everything I've collected as I've been doing this research, you know, we understand the Game Boy to be this mega hit. Mm-hmm. And of course, it was financially um, a success when it came out, I understand. Mm-hmm. But from the, from the, it was also kind of just seen as this side thing. It was like not, you know, the real games don't go on there. You know, it's, or you can go play Mario Land. That's cute. That was, uh, R&D one made this four level kind of Mario game. Mm-hmm. But, but, you know, it's, these are tiny little things for people to just take with them. Right. Obviously, you're more limited on the Game Boy. I mean, Absolutely. there's only so much space. You can only put in so many characters for for speech and and inter- that'll fit on the screen. Isn't I mean, it like, like only 240 pixels wide or something like that? That oh, screen that I do not know, it's but not it's a lot. To it's work little. With. Yeah. So they can't have this like big giant, you know, g- giant for the time, of course, you know, <laughs> giant game, <laughs> giant game Heck yeah. on, on a Game Boy. So I, I, I so then what happens is the execs basically say, yeah, sure. But they get a little idea and they say, actually, actually, do you think you could port a link to the past right. to the Game Boy? Mm-hmm. And um, it was pretty obvious to Dezuka that they couldn't just literally port it, meaning they couldn't take the link to the past code, but maybe they could rebuild it. Right. So um, an official decision is made. The development on a link to the past port for the Game Boy would happen. <laughs> I'm sure he was like... This again? Like, <laughs> I tried to get away from this. Yeah, dang imagine, it. imagine Tezuka in that meeting where he's like, "Guys, guys, okay, we've been working on this super cool thing, right? And it's a little different than a link to the past, it's a and silly. we hope you like it." And then they go, "Great, that's great. Um, can you make a link to the past <laughs> again? <laughs> can I so, just have my game already?" Oh my gosh, this is kind of interesting because what you know, fine, they get the the execs give them another dev kit. It is officially a project now, so. Th- so this team can work on it during work hours and all of that. Mm-hmm. And they do start rebuilding a link to the past a little bit. But slowly but surely, all these little quirks and things start working their way back into the game. Mm-hmm. I wonder if uh, 
if uh, Mr. Takashi Tezuka didn't mind if some of those things they, they were exploring a little bit. Because mm-hmm. also, they, I have a quote for later on in my notes here, but he kind of basically says, like, a lot of this was for the Game Boy, so there wasn't a lot of attention, you know, on, on a lot of these things that we were doing. Right. So, <clears throat> pardon me. So as the game is getting built, they're realizing that, oh, 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 I wanted to add this in. Um, so fine. So it's an official thing. And the, uh, the game makers say, okay, we, we, okay, since we're building a real official game now, let's, we, we need an engine. And so there was a little game called The Frog for Whom the Bell Tolls that was released oh. by R&D1. Have you heard of this game? I did. It's kind of out there in culture a little. I did see it mentioned while I was looking this up, yeah. So I actually learned about The Frog for Whom the Bell Tolls a long time ago when I was trying to figure out who's the guy with all the frogs in Link's Awakening. I mm-hmm. did some Googling and I, I read that, oh, he's a, that's a cameo character from this other game that only came out in Japan. Right. I didn't think about it anymore. Yeah. But what I, what I learned while I was researching for this episode, I learned that the, that f- f- I've, I've actually watched a couple of videos about, uh, from this, of this game now. And apparently there's like a fan translation ROM out there, but I don't really know if that's super ethical to play it or not, <laughs> but it's not like it ever got sold in America. So mm-hmm. I don't know, you know, that's, that's for de- up for debate, but um, the frog for whom the bell tolls, I keep wanting to say the, the bell tolls for the frog, <laughs> the frog for whom the bell tolls was actually an R and D one made game. Not, not EAD. Mm. And it used an overworld that looked straight down like a Zelda game. Okay. And then it would actually transfer to side scrolling elements when, when characters would go inside um, caves and buildings and towns and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I don't know how this was decided. I don't know if this was, this is around 1992 now. The Frog for Whom the Bell Tolls was released in Japan in 1992. Okay. So I don't know if this was chosen before that game came out or after. Mm-hmm. But basically, the EAD team either gets permission or maybe a few R&D one people came over to EAD to make this Link's Awakening game. Mm-hmm. But the quick story is they took they, they took the the frog for whom the bell tolls engine and they use that as their base. Oh, okay. So if you ever see screenshots or videos of the frog for whom the bell tolls, it looks... Like Legend of Zelda, the like the little flowers and the bushes, it's almost the same graphics, and these amount of tiles that are on the screen is almost the same. Hmm. It's it's very it's interesting. And now yeah. plenty of games do that now too. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. So anyway, so I thought that was kind of interesting, and then so they take that and they start basically building on top of that engine. They strip that engine down and start building on top of that mm-hmm. an interpretation of a link to the past. Mm-hmm. Okay. This is when I understand the Dreaming Island um, working title is when it was kind of assigned, mm-hmm. like unofficially signed was right around this time. Mm-hmm. Because I think before this, before that meeting with the execs, it was just called Tezuki's crazy thing he does at night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Unofficial title. <laughs> Unofficial title. Um, um, the base. Da, 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 da. Oh, also, because this was just a port, the execs did not put Miyamoto on the project. They said, okay, we don't need it. You guys are just going to do a port. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Build it. There's not a lot of creative choices going on here. Just make the, make, you know, remake the game. So Miyamoto was off, you know, working on something else. And uh, in fact, he might have been, he might have been poking around with, with like early Nintendo 64 stuff at that point. Because we, we learned in our Zelda 64 episode that pretty shortly after A Link to the Past, um, Miyamoto was already interested in trying to remake Zelda 2 in mm. 3D for the Super Nintendo, wasn't he? <laughs> Remember that? I almost forgot about that. If you don't remember, it's okay. There's so much. There's so much. <laughs> yeah. we. I remember this. This is back in season two. For the Zelda 64 episode, we learned that right after Link's Awakening, Miyamoto wanted to use the Super FX chip, the chip that powered Star Fox and a few oh, other games. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he wanted to make a 3D version of Zelda mm-hmm. 2. I don't remember what I did two days ago, so I apologize. <laughs> it's all good. Um Um. So he was probably off working on that. I just realized. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so Miyamoto wasn't around to tell them keep the sword right don't do item doubling right and um the creative creativity kind of blew up and they started doing a lot of stuff also yeah. by the way you might notice that um anuma hasn't been mentioned yet ig anuma mm-hmm. kind of the the patron saint of zelda at this point <laughs> yep the, uh, the the producer of the series ever since mm-hmm. majora's mask but he was working at the he was working at nintendo i learned he came around, but he was doing. A, he was also doing other things. I think he was an artist initially. Actually, by the way, gotcha. I think he came into the company as like a designer or a graphic artist or something like that. Um, but anyway, I read in a, in an Awada Asks interview that Anuma said that he was aware of the project 
and kind of thought it was like a little crazy. Mm -hmm. Um, In fact, this is where now, if you'd like to speak about some of the story development and some of the Twin Peaks connections and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. I don't know. So basically at this point now, the game has, the game was secretly starting to morph away from Link to the Past. Right. And eventually they were able to get permission to have it be a wholly new game. And this is when the wheels really came off the cart. I'm sure you have some information about this. Yeah. So from what I understand, they were kind of looking to make a spinoff more so, you know, like its own separate little, obviously not completely super related. Um, So in that vein, like they specifically did not want to include Princess Zelda. They specifically did not want to include the Triforce. They wanted to make this similar enough to be recognizable, but completely different. And like you said, I was definitely seeing many, many references to that Twin Peaks uh, inspiration. So they wanted to make sure to have like a an odd little town with odd little people, um, you know, where the, the characters aren't necessarily like inherently or obviously good they wanted to make them kind of mysterious and kind of weird and you're not sure if they're good or not yes. they can be suspicious quote unquote um it, we wanted them to have like funny dialogue so not just like boring little blah 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 it should be like funny it should be more dialogue it and should be more story centric i just remember that was the first thing you said about links to the past in that ep- season one episode six episode the fir- one of the first things you said in that episode was oh this game's funny I like remember you saying that when we were doing our review episode for mm-hmm. Link's Awakening. And uh, we both, I didn't even realize it at the time. And I had to kind of go back and look at the dialogue. I was like, oh, this is funny. It's kind yep. of meta sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, the little kids say like, I'm saying this, but I don't know why I'm saying that. I'm yeah. just a kid. <laughs> That's it, right. I'm just a kid. I don't know what's going on. It was a little self-aware. And yeah, yes. you're right. It's even been said that like they thought they were kind of making a parody almost of, of, of a Zelda game. Yes. But, but I, I do want to uh, also add in that when um, Tezuka was given permission to make his own game, that's when he brought in um, Tanabe, mm-hmm. Kanuke Tanabe, and um, Yoshiaki Koizumi. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if that name sounds familiar to you or not. Koizumi? I've mentioned it a few times in other episodes. Koizumi, Aiji Anuma, and Miyamoto were like the three main directors for, creators for Ocarina of Time. Oh, okay. So I'm going forward in time here a little bit for my story. One of the three patron saints. So. But you might remember that in the, well, at least I remember in the Zelda 64 episode because I had to like re- research it so much mm-hmm. um, that after Ocarina of Time, Kazumi started working on all the Mario games. He worked on Mario Galaxy, Mario Galaxy 2. Oh, okay. And these days he's in charge of basically all the 3D Mario games. Okay. And Anuma went off and did the Zelda stuff. Right. So, Currently, right now, in, in the year of 2021 or whatever, 2022, are we in 21? What are, year are we? We are currently in 21, but oh, yeah, we'll yeah, see yeah. when this episode comes out. Oh, this one's a quick one. This one's going to come out soon, actually. Okay, cool. Then um, definitely still 2021. I've almost lost track of the years just because of the weird, the way the weird seasons have. I, basically, what I'm telling you is my clock goes by Zelda episodes, by <laughs> EZP episodes. That's fine and totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> it's like not consuming my life or anything. I'm just saying. Definitely not. <laughs> you can't. Those of you that are not able to watch the video version of this do are not seeing my eyes darting back and forth. <laughs> so much eye rolls. Um, okay. So anyway, but so Takashi brings them on as writers. And what was interesting about this is that Tanabe was finally able to realize his world ending with a crazy egg on an island thing. Yes. yes. But <clears throat> Koizumi was actually actually went to school to be a film major. And then came when came to mm-hmm. Nintendo because he wanted to bring more cinematic elements to video games, mm-hmm. which is interesting because I wonder if that informed. Like I remember in Super Mario Galaxy, they rewrote the the cinematic engine and stuff like that so they could do extra shots and all of that. Mm-hmm. That might have been Koizumi. Now that we can we can maybe um, extrapolate. Infer, yeah, that, that's what <laughs> happened. But anyway, um, what came of that is I have, and this is so. Um, this is a quote I have from Tanabi. Mm-hmm. Tanabe said, and actually this quote was found, we had a gentleman um, named Dan Murphy who helped us uh, collect some notes for this episode. Thank you, Dan. You collected notes, I collected notes. He and I were in a production meeting for a different Zelda episode, and he heard that we were doing this episode, and he said, whoa, let me help. I'll find some notes for you guys, too. And so we officially have our third writer on this episode, Kate, which I think is kind of fun. Yes. It's the first time we've ever had an an extra writer for an episode. I love it. Appreciate it. It's very cool. And he was very excited to share this stuff. And and, and he he found so much information. Some of it's stuff that you found and I found as well, so I kind of just condensed it all together. But this is definitely something I did not find and Dan did. So this is a, he got he got me a couple quotes. He got us a couple quotes. Nice. One of them is um, from Tanabe here, and this is speaking to the once the game was okayed to be a its own game. Mm-hmm. And maybe after this quote, we'll go to break. Sure. 
Tanabe says, um, when it started, when I started, I was given a list of requirements by director Mr. Tezuka, such as no Princess Zelda, no Triforce, no Hyrule, and a closed field. I recall having a lot of trouble with storyline consistency in A Link to the Past, and this meant I couldn't leave out the stuff that got bottlenecked. Mr. Tezuka requested a world full of strange characters, <laughs> like in Twin Peaks, mm-hmm. which was a popular show back then. I wrote a script that fit my vision of an egg hatching on a mountaintop, ending the world with Kazumi's Your Dream, um, Your Dream in quotes there, like is the game your dream or not, or someone else's dream. Kazumi worked on the main thread of story, and I did the odd characters. So we could we could also take from that quote that Tanabe was able to bring some of the quirkiness in, mm-hmm. you know, the different thing, the the crazy egg concept and mm-hmm. all of that. But then Kazumi here had this idea of the dream stuff, you know, and and also then I collected a quote. I don't know if I found this or Dan found this. It might. I'll just give credit to Dan. But um, um, Tezuka says. Tezuka says, so when I came to Link's Awakening, I wanted to make something that, while it would be small enough in scope and to easily understand, it would have deep and distinctive characters. You stole my quote. Oh, you had it? I did have that quote. You found that in the Iwata Ask episode. I found that. Or article. That was a good one. Did you read it? Yep. Mm -hmm. Oof. That was, I enjoyed all of that. I think they were technically meeting to talk about the Link's Awakening remake or something, but they they were like reminiscing about other Mm -hmm. games and it was a, it was a great read. Yeah. Um, so I guess we're realizing here. Oh, and then I have one more quote from Anuma regarding Ko- Koizumi. We're learning a little bit more about this guy. He was a mystery to me. He was just the guy that made the Mario games after a while for me. But, um, um, oh, no, this is not Anuma. This is Iwata in that same Iwata asks. He said, Koizumi, the romantic, was in charge of the story. And he had quite a large influence on the general direction of all the Zelda series. Uh, and I'm not quoting anymore because of the choices he made during that story. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's funny that um, Anuma was watching this happen, working on something else. Mm-hmm. And he, I, I've got the quote in here somewhere. I can't find it. I'm scrolling up and down like crazy in my notes. But um, um, Anuma basically thought that it was a crazy idea. I feel like it's worth trying to find here. I'm just looking real quick. Well, on that note, maybe we take a break. And we come back with a quote. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's do keep it. the listeners in suspense. What is this quote? What is the quote? It's kind of funny. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And it's really, it's interesting knowing the fate of where Numa went and where Kazumi went, mm-hmm. you know, with, with their game making. But thank you so much for helping me host us into our break here, Kate. I was losing track a little bit. And um, we'll be back in just a few minutes. We'll be right back. Jake, have you ever been looking for a definitive Nintendo ranking and can't seem to find it because it's just everybody's own opinion? Honestly, all the time, Sam. Well, I'm looking for someone to give us the answers. Wait, you mean like a podcast made by two young, handsome men where they create a definitive top five list of all things Nintendo? Should we just do it ourselves? Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Let's give it a shot. I'm Sam. And I'm Jake. And And at at Top 5 5 Nintendo, Nintendo, I'm going to give you my top five list. And I'm going to give you my top five list. And then we're going to duke it out and see what the real top five is. Welcome to our new podcast. Welcome to our new podcast. This isn't working. Agreed. I think we're going to have to do it turn by turn. Well, now that you mention it, we are a brand new RPG video game podcast. Our very existence hinges on turn-based gaming. So join us on the Turn by Turn podcast, where we'll be talking about Pokemon, Fire Emblem, Golden Sun, Shining Force, Mother, and so many more. It's your turn to come and join us. From the break, Kate, and I found my quote. Found the quote. Oh, it was on. It was a page down, is what it was. I'm sure people are just chomping at the bit to hear this quote. Well, it's you know the quote is fine, but the like what the implications are is actually kind of fun. So um, Anuma said later on, mm-hmm. looking back, um, he said he lost the quote again. It's gone. Oh, yeah. No, okay, yeah. So Anuma says, yeah, I know, I know. I found it. I found it. Basically, he learned that Tezuki said that he wanted to 
make all the characters mysterious like Twin Peaks. Right. And I think every, I think Twin Peaks, everyone knows about the Twin Peaks fact at this point of Link's Awakening. Mm-hmm. But it was a mysterious game or a show that had to do with dreams and stuff like that. And um, um, when Anuma heard that this is the direction Tezuki was taking the Zelda game, Anuma said, and I quote, really? You really want to do that? You really want to make a Zelda like that? <laughs> so the, the quote's normal, but... <laughs> Like Sad. Anuma was throwing shade. Yeah, I know. He's like, "This is what you want to do with Zelda?" Yes. And um, and it's funny because Koizumi was the one also coming up with all these crazy stories and stuff. They were writing. Koizumi was writing these these characters along with Tanabe and T- Takasha. T- I said his name so wrong. I'm so sorry, Tezuka. <laughs> Tezuka. <laughs> but isn't it funny that post Ocarina of Time, Anuma is the one that ends up taking Zelda, the game that's kind of known for story, Mm -hmm. takes the leadership there. And then um, Kazumi, who apparently is like this film head who loves to write crazy stuff, takes Mario, which is not necessarily known for story. Isn't it? That's that's what I think is really kind of interesting here. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. I'm not saying that Mario games don't have story. In fact, I think I think if Mm. as I realized earlier, I mean, they have stories that's like serve. A, a reason to get to the end, I guess. I think they both, I mean, both Zelda and Mario have the whole, like, the same story to a certain point. You know, it's the same basic principles. It's the same kind of idea from game to game to game to game. Like, yeah. rescue the princess, you know, <laughs> like, and, and, and other, you know, things within that. But that's why Link's Awakening is cool because it breaks that mold well it's still like it's proof that you can have a sequel that's not just a redo yeah it's like a sequel but it's you know i mean what they wanted was like a spin-off and it is like it's something that's still in the zelda universe it still makes sense for zelda it still has well it doesn't have you know the triforce and zelda specifically Mm -hmm. it still has like uh, collecting, you know, a certain amount of these things and, you know, dungeons to get to. In fact, eight dungeons. Right. I, I read that they specifically wanted to keep that part of the format, that it was eight dungeons. So right. at least that part would feel familiar. Right. So it's still a Zelda game, but it's I appreciate that it's different because sometimes blasphemy, I know they can get a little repetitive in certain ways. Yeah. Um, so. Well, for what different. it's worth, I think IG Anuma came around a little bit because in other reports, in other interviews I've, I've read of notes that I don't have here in front of me, he said things like Link's Awakening ch- what, you know, changed the course of, of Zelda games, whether yeah. it knew it or not at the time. Because it was a, such a, not a left turn, but it was a lane change for Zelda games. For sure. That um, he's even, I think a lot of people know this, but like kind of famously, Anuma has said that if, if they would have gone from Link's, Link to the Past to Ocarina, without Link's Awakening in the middle, Ocarina would have been a very different game. Mm -hmm. Basically, they would have been just more channeling. Because if you think about Ocarina, that also has a bunch of spooky, weird characters and stuff. And like, you know, quirky, quirky little story threads and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then Majora's Mask even more so. So I guess Anuma got excited by this and just dove straight in. Yeah. So maybe at first he was a little surprised, but obviously came around on the whole thing. He's even Mm -hmm. gone so far to say that he thinks that Link's Awakening is the uh, definitive 2D Zelda game. I read that. Oh, did you too? Yeah, isometric. Isometric, indeed. And I was like, I've heard that word before, but I need to look it up. <laughs> In terms of video games, like, what does that yeah. mean for video games? So, um, there was a couple. So, you know, the 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 everything is available. Um, so, I kind of have a list here of things that are different. Yes, th- that were different along the path. And yeah. maybe I know you've got a few too. Maybe we can kind of go back and forth. Yeah. The one thing I want to say before that is that when they were writing the story, it was written that um, this is the same link from A Link to the Past. Okay. Like, it wasn't that big of a deal back then. There was right. only four Zelda games. Right. It didn't the, become this big, huge thing yet. Yeah, it was basically that he had gone off to try to train more and, you know, and then got in this boat accident yep. and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, which is interesting because if you look at the Hyrule Historia timeline right now, both Oracle games are actually in between A Link to the Past and Link's Awakening. Mm. So one could deduce that all four of those games, it's the same Link, which is kind of fun. Cool. Yeah, that's neat. Like if you play through them, you don't care so much. I care so much. <laughs> I, care, I, care, I care so much. <laughs> I think it's kind of fun. Um, so there's that. And then also I just want to say like there's obviously this idea that like what's really one thing that kind of changes the tone of the entire game is that Link isn't saving the day in Link's Awakening. Mm-hmm. Link is 
just trying to get home. Mm -hmm. And if you were to flip this story in a different way and you were trying to talk about, if you were trying to take a Ganondorf who was just trying to <coughs> return to the desert or something and he was going around and like destroying these eight temples or whatever it is, mm -hmm. these these nice people that just live in these temples, <laughs> we would say, look at this look at this great backstory for this evil character. I know. And so from a certain perspective, from the perspective of some, I mean, I, I'm reminded of some of the bad guys, some of the bosses that literally plead with Link saying, please don't do this mm -hmm. while you're while you're playing the game. Oh. I know. Like <laughs> Link's, from the perspective of Link, he wants to get home, he wants to get out of there, but there there is technically, and, and you're going to play the game as a, as a player. It's not like you're going to say like, well, I'm not going to go into that dungeon. Right. But I think it's a nice thread there. Instead of like just being a hero, he's... He's not self-serving at all, but he really is just trying. He got stuck somewhere, and he's just trying to get out. Right, right. He's you know? not. He's not like you said. He's not trying to save the world. In fact, he's kind of like trying to end the world. <laughs> he's trying to save himself, which means he has to end the world. Yeah. Um, Dark. Yeah, I know. Maybe, maybe, maybe if that's the after. I wonder what comes after a link to the past in the timeline. Because maybe he just could have stuck around with Malin and been just fine, or Marin. I mean. <laughs> hmm. I mean, yeah, she was, she, I'm sure she'd be very happy like, with him sticking around. Yeah. Wow. That link has quite the adventure because if he, if he goes through all the Oracle games and Link's Awakening, like none of that stuff is in Hyrule. But anyway, just goes out, explores yep. on his own. I mean, I like if not all the games have to be in Hyrule, they could be other places. Yeah. I love Why that. Not? not all of them are. Yeah. So what are some of the other differences with this game? I know you've got some notes. Yeah. So I have, um, from what I read, it's like the first game to feature fishing. Yes. You, yeah. Okay. I wanted to make sure that was correct because I was like, really? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the first to feature fishing, obviously that comes back many a time. Mm -hmm. um, definitely more so in Ocarina of and Time. And do you know who programmed the fishing game in Link's Awakening? Tell me. I will tell you. It is Kazuki Morita, the original guy that was tinkering with the Game Boy dev kit that Kazumi, or I mean, Takasha. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, take three. I'm so sorry. Tezuka? Tezuka passed and saw. So the guy that wanted to just just tinker and make stuff, yeah. while they're making Link's Awakening, he's like, I really like fishing. Can I, mean, can I make a fishing game in there? I really like and they did it. And I think I, it's wonderful. It's the first one that lets Link grab cuckoos. Oh, yeah, you're right. So like that, obviously carried over as you well. you fly around on the top. Mm -hmm. And you even use that same mechanic where you kind of help them, you float with them, I guess, yep. in, which was in Ocarina. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then also, I think the first game with a trading sequence. Yes, yes. Yeah. There is a parable out there about, I don't remember the name of it, and I didn't write this down, but because you brought that up, that the I remember the it was one of the writers that came up with this um, trading sequence. Isn't that right? One of the main writers put it in there. I don't know if I have all of that. But anyway, um, oh, Tanabi. It was, it was one of the head writers. Tanabi, oh, the guy okay. with the, the idea of the egg on the mountain, mm -hmm. um, came up with the trading sequence. But I, re I read a long time ago, way before this researching this episode, that he had mentioned that there was a parable about a man who traded a, a pea for, you know, a castle or something like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you technically just keep trading up, you know, the idea is someone's junk is someone else's treasure. Right. And, and if you do it right, you can end up doing this massive long thing and get something really nice at the end. And he wanted to kind of explore that a little bit as a trading sequence in the game. And that has obviously been a part of <laughs> a staple. Yeah, indeed. Do indeed. you like those? Do you do you like the trading sequences? Do you find them? I have mixed emotions about the trading sequences. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're a bit tedious. There's right. like two or three in Link's Awakening where you're kind of like, well, I'm I'm giving this to who now? Yeah, you know what I mean. There there was I don't I try as much as possible to never look at strategy guides or walkthroughs when I play a game. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's in my normal gaming style to not even consider pulling one up. But I did have to pull one up for one of the trades in Link's Awakening when I was replaying it on the Switch. Mm. I had forgotten what I had done on the Game Boy version, even just from a couple of years ago. Gotcha. Maybe because the game looked a little different, or I don't even know. But um, I couldn't remember where I went with something. <laughs> and and eventually it was like, oh, okay, you, know, you give it to the hippo or you give it to the alligator or right. something. <laughs> you know, you one know. of those normal things. What was the reason? Um, so I have, I'm, there's, there's kind of some fun trading sequences in the Oracle games. <laughs> The trading sequence in Ocarina is kind of the masks, I would say. Is that right? Or is there another one? There's that, but uh, the swords, too. Oh, to right? get the Begoron sword. The, yeah, right. You're There's right. That you're one. right. I forgot about that. I only don't like them when, when they're timed because then I feel too much pressure. When, is like, there a game where it is timed? Not the whole 
sequence, but like one thing like, oh, you have to get the soup to someone while it's hot. I was just going to bring up the soup because the Skyward Sword, we're both playing it right yep, now. Yep, exactly. And I'm like, Ugh. and it's not difficult to do. You just fly right there and you can do it in like you two can do minutes. It quick but enough. I still don't like it. I, I, um, pressure. I'm, I haven't even tried it yet. In, in Skyward Sword HD because they were like, well, this is the tasty soup. Get it to so-and-so before it gets cold. And I was just reminded, oh, another example of that is like keeping the spring water hot for the yes. Goron and Twilight Princess. Yes. I don't know if that's a full on like trading sequence. Oh, that one might be actually, that might be part of the Twilight yeah. Princess trading sequence. And that one, that one I remember being harder. Like that one was, I had screwed it up. I think that opens up an extra area and I don't know if I've ever pulled that one off. I don't have an exact memory of actually truly getting the hot water to the Goron. And maybe I just always have to go around the long way or something. I thought there was a timed one in Ocarina though, too, where you have to get, it's like the mushroom mixture. So there's something that you have to get to lake. You might be onto something. To the here. lake before that expires and some kind. And there's like your little timer in the corner of the screen. The maybe. gist is, yeah. I don't like that one. <laughs> But I like them in general because I think it's neat to like. I think they're cute. Yeah, they're clever. It's fun. Like helping people. I will say like um, one of the best thing about the, the one of the most fun things about trading sequences is that when you meet a character in a Zelda game or any game, but when you meet a character in a Zelda game, and I'm specifically thinking of the Oracle games right now is the memory I have in my head, but I'm sure it applies to many. And you meet a character who obviously expresses that they just need something or want something. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of like, ooh, is this going to be one of the links? What is going to be one of the links in the chain of 20 things I'm going to, and you know, I just have, I have <laughs> yeah. to remember that this person loves bears or like in Sky Return, I have to remember that this person's upset with his dad. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's kind of fun to like, kind of get those little pings and mm -hmm. then find the beginning and slowly thread it all together. Yeah. That is fun actually. Oh, well, we've kind of morphed into a whole different episode. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> no, I like it. Um, um the, I, have a, I have a little quote about the dungeons when they were making the dungeons that's sure. different. Do you have any dungeon stuff? I don't. Okay, cool. Um, so I read here that um, so this is a one of the just one of the coders, and this one's Yasu Yas Yahushi. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yasuhisa Yamura. Okay. The last names are always easier for some reason right. with Japanese <laughs> names. I I mean I I apologize for the, my horrible pronunciations, but for some reason the vowels or something in the last names. They track for me. It's not in English. It's okay. Yamura. Um, Yamamura. This is also another quote from Dan that he gave, he gave us. Okay. So um, uh, this designer, this designer said back then there were dungeons where once you understand it, you can get to the boss after navigating only half the dungeon by solving puzzles in each area and gradually opening shortcuts. It's not that we wanted to carelessly create rooms you'd never need to visit, but rather we divided some of the dungeons into rooms where only people who wanted to go will go. Mm. And there was some opposition to that while they were doing it. So there are many rooms in Link's Awakening where you go into a dungeon, you're like, oh, okay, this, you know, I got my little gem or heart or whatever, but mm. they're not mandatory to get to the end. Right. And uh, I guess rooms like that are few and far between. Certainly, certainly thinking about the original Legend of Zelda... Even that first dungeon, you can go up and to the left and like to get to talk to the old man or this or that. Maybe there's a few things, but for the most part, every room matters right. in a lot of the dungeons. Yep. Certainly in the 3D Zeldas, I feel like every room matters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as I think about it. Um, so I thought that was interesting. This was the first, uh, th not, it was a first in a different way. This game had two um, f women uh, writers who wrote the music. Oh, cool. Yeah. Their names were, he, um, here we go. <laughs> Commit to it. Kozue, Koz, Kozue Ishikawa, Ishikawa and Minako Himano. And another fun fact about uh, these two ladies is that this was the first game they ever worked on. It was the first game they ever wrote music oh, for wow. or anything. That's and now awesome. think about some of these like melodies that are so classic now. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. the, the, I don't even know, Ma Malin song or Marin song and, and the Ballad of the Windfish and all this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Super cool. Nice. Also, uh, I might have a few things. Yeah, what do you got? Yeah, um, we'll talk about the cameos. We were going to talk about oh, let's that, do it. right? Mm -hmm. So cameos from Mario, Yoshi, Kirby, which I read that they were like, we're not sure we got permission to use Kirby, but we just did that anyway. <laughs> well, I have a quote about that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, regarding the cameos, Tezuka said, it was for the Game Boy system. So we thought, well, it'll be all right. <laughs> like, no one will care. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> they're Goombas, they're Chain Chomps, obviously. There's a picture of Princess Peach, but she yep. doesn't actually, like, she's not a character, but you see mm -hmm. the picture and you're like, that's Princess Peach. That's yeah. very clear. What does it actually say? It's not Daisy. It actually says, like, Penel not none of this. I don't even know. Yeah, it was, it's like, one of name. the animals that it, 
to choose oh, pretending yeah, to be or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was definitely Princess Peach. So that's cool. A little fun, fun little thing. So there's there's jokes, there's funny characters, there's fun cameos. It's just fun. Yeah, that's um, that's good stuff. Obviously, one of the new things was the the item. Comp, I know we've kind of talked about this already, but bringing mm-hmm. the items together. Mm-hmm. The famous example is that if you equip a bomb and quick an air, equip an arrow and then hit A and B at the same time, you'll release a bomb arrow, mm-hmm. which I never knew when I played the first time. Mm-hmm. I definitely had to just kind of learn about that through the internet, um, just by accident learn about it. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, and then it's the first Zelda game where Link doesn't always have to have his sword. Oh. By by extension, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I do know that Miyamoto came on as a game tester towards the end of development once it had become its own real game. Mm-hmm. And uh, by then, the story goes that he was pretty satisfied with it. He had a couple comments, but um, fortunately, he didn't say, what's up with this sword thing? <laughs> <laughs> nice. I The only other thing I have is like after it was released. So if you Well, so yeah, the game that. comes out in 1993. Yeah. And just as a side note, the development for Ocarina of Time started in 1994. So a lot mm-hmm. of the people who worked on Link's Awakening, moved on to Ocarina of Time. Mm-hmm. I think that was instrumental to Ocarina of Time, I'm realizing. Mm-hmm. came out in 1993, and it was, I believe, a great success. It got really good reviews. Yes. Um, yeah, reading the reviews, like, on the Wikipedia page, it's, like, 8.7 to 10 out of 10, depending on who you're looking at. So, yeah, definitely well-reviewed. It's one of, like, Game Informers, I think it was, like, number three on their Game Boy game list oh, like really? top 25 game boy games and it's like number three yeah um it's also within their like top 100 nintendo games period okay sure um, and yeah so between the original version of link's awakening and then the dx version of right. it it sold over six million copies Ooh, cool i don't have any of that data yeah, that's good so to know clearly did okay yeah definitely <laughs> interesting yeah link's awakening um well, the, the last thing I have here is another quote from Takashi Tezuka. Cool. I, believe, I believe this was also provided by Dan. And it says, it's a fun game filled with memories. Our desire to make something awesome for the Game Boy with a bit of silliness felt right uh, felt right to put it in like a spin-off uh, situation. Mm-hmm. Even assessing the game with the company five years later, it was a success. I'm pretty happy. So wow. Tez- Tezuka got his thing. And he's yeah. actually still very active, by the way, yeah. at Nintendo. Yep. I mm-hmm. just I just looked him up while we were before we started recording. I'm like, what's this guy up to now? Mm-hmm. So cool. Um, my fun fact for after it was released is that uh, so once it was released, Nintendo sponsored a cross country train <laughs> competition. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. I would that I was like, that's a sentence that exists. I kind of remember that it didn't go great, that people like beat the game too quick or they couldn't exactly figure out who was beating it when or something mm. like that. But anyway. Yeah. Cause the point was it was a race. Like it, it had them test the game in a timed race. So they were trying to get them to beat it as quickly as possible. And it was trying to like showcase the game and be like, look how portable the game boy is. You can use it on a train. Yeah, Basically. Yeah. So yeah. I yeah. They played the cool. Zelda game across the whole country because they were on this train. Oh, um, man. For you, I know the first time you played it, played it was for our review episode in season one. Yeah. What was your first time kind of becoming aware of Link's Awakening? Was it it was after discovering Ocarina of Time? Uh, yeah. I mean, it may have been like during our podcast. <laughs> I don't know why, because I was obsessed with my Game Boy. Like I had so many games and they were probably the crappiest games. Like I probably, for whatever reason, always bought the dumbest games for Game Boy. Um <laughs> Because it's me. I don't know. I gravitate to what Bill and I call baby games, like on the Switch, which are like games that take four hours to beat and they're not very complicated and they're not very like. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you do have a lot of them on your kind of in your profile when I I, I peek. It's like everything played for like four hours and that's it because then I've beaten them. But But that's cool too because a lot of times they're like little indie games. Yeah, exactly. But I didn't know about this game when I had my Game Boy. And I mean, granted, when this one came out, I was like seven. So, um, and I'm, I can't remember exactly when I got my Game Boy. It wouldn't have been long after that, but I don't know. I never came across this one. Mm-hmm. So I don't think I knew. In general, I don't know too much about the handheld Legend of Zelda games. We've talked right. about Like, I haven't played a lot of them. Now I've, now I've played a couple I through the podcast. I can't wait for you to play the Oracle games. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, that's probably a year or two away yet. You know what I mean? Just because at the time it takes to play a game. Right. But I think if you play them on a Game Boy Color on a screen, I think you're going to thoroughly enjoy them, especially now that you've kind of had both ends of the spectrum. You've had the Minish Cap and Link's Awakening. Yes. I think you will. You will enjoy them. I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. 
Um, for me, I, I think I, I don't know if I learned of, yeah, no, right. That's what it was. I've told the story in the past. I kind of was aware of Link's Awakening, mm-hmm. but I ended up asking for it as a gift shortly, maybe a year or so before Ocarina of Time came out. Ah. Yeah, or even, even a couple of years before it came out, because I remember <laughs> like getting news about the development. And that was my, as I said, in our very first episode of this show ever, it was my first Zelda game that I ever played. Oh, that's right. And so a fun little nugget of info. Uh, the way that worked then is that I didn't even know that Zelda was a thing or that Hyrule was a thing. Oh, yeah. Or, or that Ganon was a thing. I played Link's Awakening being like, yeah, this tracks. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> totally normal Zelda game. Yeah, totally normal Nothing Zelda game. Nothing weird here. And then I'd go, you know, I'd play Ocarina of Time and I was like, who is this Zelda? And look at Ganondorf. This is, yeah. well, this is interesting stuff. They're really taking a left turn here. <laughs> so if there was no Zelda in Link's Awakening, did you think Link was Zelda? Did you make that horrible no, I th- rookie you know, mistake? <laughs> well, I knew enough from the original Legend of Zelda game that Zelda was like the princess. Oh, okay. But I guess I kind of figured at the time that I, I was I was too young to know that Hyrule was a thing when I the few times I played the original Legend of Zelda as a little kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I certainly never saw Zelda in, in the original Legend of Zelda. I certainly never got to the end or anything. You technically see her for a second in the beginning of Zelda 2. She's sleeping. Mm-hmm. Um, so I kind of think I figured that the Legend of Zelda series was more like, I don't even know if it was like the never ending story, but it was kind of like the, Zelda was 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 and is or was a thing, but not necessarily a, a like a corporeal, like, like right. a thing in the game. It's just the legend. Yeah. That's all. Like, except another way, it could have been like the legend of Hyrule. You know what I mean? Right. And I, f- I figured it was something more like that. Gotcha. Link's Awakening. Cool stuff. Awesome. So um, any any big takeaways for you here? I just liked learning more about it. Like, I know we did our review episode and that was more so about the game itself, but it was really cool to just learn how it all came about. And it was just kind of like a fun project that turned into something really awesome. So don't give up on your dreams, kids. There Make it is. those weird games. I'm cool with that. I love that concept. <laughs> That's great. That's a wonderful takeaway. Milo cameo for our magical. Oh, he just got video. on the camera. <laughs> oh boy. He's really, he's really jumping around. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's like it's not like those books are new. He lives with those books, but he's still checking them out. I know. He likes to show off when there are guests. Is that what it is? Mm-hmm. I see. Well, magical story people, we hope you're enjoying the the Milo the show cat right butt now. In the, <laughs> the cat butt. just just the oh, there he is. He's coming back Daddy. around. Um, and but with all that said, Kate, let's do let's let's get out of here. And uh, if anybody wants to find you on the internet, mm. they might have a hard time because you changed your name. I did. I'm so sorry. So well, only a little bit. So on Instagram, I was previously I only take cat pics, and now I just, I felt so bad that I wasn't giving my dog, you know, a credit and attention. So now I'm I only take t- I only take cat and dog pics. <laughs> yep, that works. Which is basically true. I only take cat and dog to and and then like put to some once in a while you'll post like an epic run that you took honestly I've yes. seen I've seen some pretty good posts that way yeah you just ran a marathon recently half marathon was that what it was let's not make it more impressive than it was okay it was a half marathon I've never run a half marathon I will only go up to thirteen miles and then uh, I hurt all over running thirteen miles yes that's a half marathon yeah mm-hmm. I, but I never would do twenty six because my body hurt so bad after thirteen. I could not move the next day. <laughs> so. I I will bike thirty forty miles and I'll love it. But biking is so different than running. Yes. I don't think I could run f- thirteen miles. You can do it if you train. Anyone can. Do I it. guess if you train. But yeah. usually I'm I'm when I like go like take a jog. I'm puttering out around four miles. Honestly, if you can do it. If you can do four, <laughs> you can do thirteen. That's what people told me. Really? Although they also told me if you can do thirteen, you can do twenty six. And I said, get out of here. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> well, people can find you on Instagram at I only take dog and cat pics or cat, cat and, and dog, dog pics. pics. Yes. So I only take cat is still in the search at least. Yes. Maybe that's a few people. Yes. Find so they can still. probably still find me. Yeah. <laughs> People can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Raptor Paint. The show, of course, is uh, Another Zelda Pod on Twitter, Another Zelda Podcast on Instagram. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook. Uh, we, we're, we're on Pinterest now, Discord, all the things. We're everywhere. That's basically searching Another Zelda Podcast. We also have links to all of those things on our website, anotherzeldapodcast.com. You can't escape us. <laughs> if resistance you, is futile if you head to another zelda podcast.com you can also learn about uh, or you can find a bunch of blog posts that we have we have mm-hmm. a whole team of writers now that write for us many of which have also been guests on the show now yeah the only, i think the last three is it was andy barney um the, who has a, a youtube channel mm-hmm. um zelda and then the, the coons ryan coon from brothers in law and mallory coon who's written a bunch of things 
for us, and then also is the author of Among Thieves. I haven't gotten Jake. those three. Wait, you have it? I have Can it. Can I see it? Yep. I bought it digitally so far. You have Among Thieves. I have it. I bought it. I haven't read it yet. I'm finishing another trilogy right now. But Ooh, it's so cool to see in real life. It is very cool that we know someone that wrote a legit novel. I started reading it digitally. I got, I'm got. i only like a chapter in because I'm doing a lot of stuff, but I thought it started off nice. I'm you excited. Know? Oh, have you not read anything yet? I haven't started it yet. I'm finishing it. She does book. that nice thing where she kind of starts with a little bit of action. Nice. Starts with action so you can learn about the world, but you're already, you can, instead of like reading 20 pages about like why the world is the way the world is, like mm -hmm. in Lord of the Rings or something, which is cool too, you're kind of like on a mission and you start learning as you go. So you can also commit to like a one chapter storyline while you learn about the bigger stuff. Cool. But I'll admit I'm only like really at that point right now. Awesome. Neat. Let's get out of here. Uh, thank All you so right. much, everybody. Have a great night. And Kate, we'll see you back on the show for our finale. Yes. We only have a couple. It's only a couple episodes away. Yes. Uh, our next episode is Dan, Dan, Dan McCoy and I uh, went out into the wilderness and, <laughs> and tried to do Breath of the Wildy things. And we talked about it in the wilderness. So cool. We literally recorded out on the land. I wanted to record outside. And with our new setup now, with all these different everything's running off batteries except for one camera. <laughs> um we can even record like kind of almost anywhere we want now. That's which is awesome. super cool. All right, Kate. Well, I'll see you then. I can't wait. And uh, that'll be that episode is Hyrule. We're still kind of circling around it. Is it Hyrule Castle? Hyrule Castle. Yeah. We're like, just going to go Hyrule Castle. I love and it. it. The different All the iterations different... of it. Yeah. I think that's a great way to end the season. I'll see you then. I'll see you in a few weeks. Well, okay. Bye. Woohoo. That was real. Woohoo is real. <laughs> 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 <laughs>